Thank you, choir. Our passage this morning is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. It's one of Jesus' most uh, well-known passages. It begins with uh, three different stories, three different parables that Jesus tells to um, the crowd and to the Pharisees. If you have your Bible, if you follow along in that or up on the screen to uh, uh, Luke chapter 15. And we need to make sure we understand who Jesus is talking to when we get to the third of the three parables. There's the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And we're going to look at the lost son today as, as, uh, as we go through this passage. But Luke 15, chapter 1 says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That wasn't the thing you did as a good rabbi. As a good prophet, as a man of God, you wouldn't be seen with, with the riffraff. You wouldn't be seen with the sinners and the tax collectors. You would, you would separate yourself from them. And, and, and they're saying, well, Jesus can't be a prophet. He can't be the son of God. He can't be this, this uh, mighty worker because of the people he hangs around with. And so verse 3 tells us that then Jesus told them this parable. Now, who is the them that Jesus is telling the parable to? The Pharisees. Did you get that? Are you with me? Say yes. Yes, it's the Pharisees. It's really important to understand that it's the Pharisees that Jesus is telling the story to, and here's why. The first of the three, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on the first two, but, but the first of the three is the, lost coin, is the lost sheep. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, suppose you were a shepherd. Now to us, that's no big deal. You're a shepherd. We, we just want to read on. But you see, in first century Judaism, a shepherd was one of the worst possible vocations you could have. A shepherd meant that you had to stay out with the stinking sheep. You weren't allowed to come into town. You were ceremoniously unclean. You were never allowed to go into the temple because you were always dirty. And so a good Pharisee would never want to be or want their son to be a shepherd. So you see, when Jesus says, suppose you're a shepherd, that's an insult. He's insulting them. But not only is he insulting them once, he insults them twice because he says, suppose you were a shepherd and you had a hundred sheep and you lost one of them. Now he doesn't say that you're a stinking shepherd. He says you're a stinking incompetent shepherd. Doesn't say the sheep ran away. Doesn't say the sheep wandered off said that the hundred of the hundred sheep that you're in charge of, one of them did what? Got lost and you lost it. You had a hundred sheep and you lost one of them. So you begin to see that, that the Pharisees are not taking this message pretty well right away. Jesus is insulting them. And if that wasn't bad enough, you go to the second parable, and if, that, and if being called a stinking, dirty, ceremoniously unclean, incompetent shepherd isn't bad enough, he says, or suppose you were a woman... Now, in first century Judaism, the Pharisees used to stand on the street corner and they used to pray, God, I thank you that I wasn't born a dog or a woman. And they used to say it in that order. So not only is he comparing them to a stinking, dirty, ceremoniously unclean, incompetent shepherd, he's he's, he's, um, uh, making them, I suppose you're a woman. I lost the word. Comparing, there it is. He's comparing them to a woman. So you see, this is not going well. So then he gets down to the third parable, and that's the one we want to look at today. He gets down to the third parable. It tells us verse 11, and Jesus continues to teach them. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the, of the inheritance, or give me my share of the estate. Now stop there, don't read on. The younger son is entitled to what of an inheritance as a younger son? Two traditions. One was nothing. Older son got it all. The other was that he might be given a little bit. I'm, you like my little thing here? It's falling all over the place, but anyway, we got new microphones. The other thing is he might be given a little bit. So if he's entitled to that, he asks for it. But, but think about this for a second. What's he really saying? When do you receive an inheritance? Somebody has to die. So what's the son really saying to his dad? Dad, you're dead to me. Or, Dad, I wish you were dead. 
That's the only way to get an inheritance. You think that might violate one of the commandments somewhere in there? Maybe. Maybe the fifth one off the top of my head? Yeah, what's the fifth one? Honor thy father and mother. What's the penalty for not honoring your father and mother? Stoning. Death. So you see, when this man says to his dad, Dad, I wish you were dead, or Dad, I'm going to live my life as if you're dead. So give me my inheritance. You mean nothing to me anymore. Give, give me what I have coming to me because to me you're dead. That's a very um, inflammatory, very humiliating thing for the father to have to deal with. And so the father's humiliated by his son. And, and so he, he can respond lots of different ways. He can turn his son in. He can uh, uh, report, that, report him to, to being dishonorable and, and bring him up or whatever he wants to do. But look what it says. It says the father, even though he's humiliated, it says he divided his property between the two sons. Even though he was, with, he was dishonored, even though the father uh, was treated as if he didn't exist anymore, he still gave the son what he asked. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a dis- distant country. Well, how did he set off in a different country? If he gets a part of the inheritance, what did he probably get from his dad? Flocks? Maybe some material goods, but, but what's probably the big thing that's been in the family for years? Land. Probably got land. Well, how do you leave with land? You got to sell it. Now, he's got to leave town quickly. Why? Honor thy father and thy mother? He's already said, I wish you were dead. He's probably going to get out, probably going to leak, probably not going to ingratiate himself to the powers that be in town, and he's got to get out of Dodge quickly. Now, I know we're using a little sanctified imagination here, but we've got to try to work through the story to make sure it makes sense in the ears of Jesus, uh, to the ears of Jesus who's telling it to. And that's what they would hear. They would hear about a son who wants his father dead, which would break the fifth commandment, which would now put a death sentence on him, and the, and the son's got to get out of town quickly. So he's going to have to sell his possessions that he just inherited, and he's probably going to sell it for top dollar, right? No. He's going to sell it as quick as he can and get out of Dodge because that's what he wants to do. He wants to live as if his father doesn't exist. He doesn't want his father over him anymore. He wants to take what he has coming to him, and he wants to get out of town and live on his own, and that's what he does. And so he gets out of town as quick as he can, and it says that he set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, I don't know what wild living means. There's no definition of wild living. Don't know what that means. We can speculate. Having grown up in the 70s, probably a lot of me and my friends might have said, Dad, I wish you were dead, or Dad, you were dead to me, or all that kind of stuff we used to do in the 70s. So I think I know a little bit about what's going on there, and maybe you do too. I see some nods in the audience. You can relate to that. Okay? So, set off on a distant country, squandered his wealth and wild living, and after he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. All right? So Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and he's talking to them... Um, good Jewish leaders, and now he's talking about this son, probably Jewish, we would assume, who's now feeding pigs. So when he ran off, did he go to a Jew or a Gentile country? Gentile country. And he's out there feeding pigs. The only work he could get, and so he's feeding pigs. And he says to himself, he says he long, it says he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Verse 17, you've got to underline that if you've got your Bible, because it's a wonderful verse. When he came to his senses... Isn't that nice? Gretchen was talking about coming home, being led home. And he came to his senses. How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? And then he devises a plan. And he says, I will set out. I'll go back to my father, and I'll say to him, Dad, I've sinned against you and against heaven. Well, that part's true. He has sinned against him, and he has sinned against heaven because he broke the fifth commandment. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So he wants to break that relationship. He wants to have a different relationship with his dad. He wants to have a relationship like this. He says, he says I'm no longer to be worthy to be called your son. So make me like one of your hired men. In other words, I'll work off my debt. 
I owe you money, you did this for me, and, and I'll pay you back, I'll just, I'll just work it off. So he got, got up and went to his father. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him. Even though the son had run off, the, the father never stopped looking for him, never stopped wondering where he was, never stopped hoping that he would see him come home. And he saw him coming, and, and he's filled with compassion. And he runs out to meet him, we're told. It says that, that, he, that when he saw him, he was filled with compassion, and he ran to his son. Now, if we're living in the first century, how do you run in the clothing that they wear? One of two ways. You either have to take off your outer garment, yes, or you've got to pull up your robes. Did you know that it was a sign of incredible humiliation for a man to show his legs in public? For the second time in the story, the man is willing to be humiliated for the sake of his son. And he runs out to his son. He runs out to his son and he throws his arms around him and kisses him. And the son begins this speech that he had said over in his head over and over and over again. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But notice he doesn't get a chance to finish it. The father cuts him off. And the father says to the servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandal on his feet. Bring a fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Why? Because God is not some cosmic killjoy. If you were to read the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, you would find that all three of them end with a party. That when the lost is found, there's a party. I'm sorry for the noise-making thing here. When the lost gets found, God throws a party. All of heaven throws a party, we're told. And this father's doing the same thing. This, this son comes and he, and he throws a party. But there's another reason why the father has the robe and the ring and the sandals put on his, on his feet. Because you see, when that son walks back through the city gates, he's a wanted man. There's a death sentence on his head. And what the father is saying by running out and throwing his arms around him and kissing him and putting the ring and the robe and the sandals on his feet is, this one belongs to me. This is my child. You can't touch him. This is my son. He was lost and now he's found. He's come home. He belongs to me. I have forgiven him. What you want to do to him no longer matters. And so he throws a party. He says, let's celebrate. The son of mine is dead and is alive. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the older son is out in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and he asked him what was going on. Your brother's come home, he said. Your father's killed the fatted calf because he's had him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry, refused to go inside. So for the third time in the story, for the sake of his sons, the father humiliates himself. He leaves his guests and goes out to his older son. And he goes out to where his son is and he says, he says um, pleads with him to come inside. But the, the older son says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. The older son says, I've never disobeyed your orders, but you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But this son of yours, notice he didn't say my brother. This son of yours squandered your property with prostitutes. By the way, how does he know that? He's been out in the field working. He doesn't know what state his brother came home in. He could have been very successful. He could have made lots of money. He could have turned his life around. He could have done all kinds of things. How, who's to say that he squandered on prostitutes? We don't know that. So he's slandering his brother making false accusations against him. The son of yours has come home and squandered your property. The prostitute says, can you kill the fatted calf? And the father says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours, notice the switch, 
this son of yours squandered this, and now the father is saying this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He's lost and found. And notice, if you will, the story ends with them still on the porch. We don't know what happens next, other than the fact that this stupid microphone won't stay in my ear. I don't know whose idea this was, but that's okay. I'm going to blame Doug. (laughs) You see, what's the overarching theme of the Bible, Wednesday nighters? Relationships. Relationships. And Jesus is trying to get the Pharisees who are in charge of the Israel people, who have been entrusted with the spiritual well-being of the Israel people, to say, look, you've lost them. They've wandered off. You're an incompetent shepherd, and they've wandered off. And, and then you begin to see that he, he gets more personal with these, with these Pharisees, and he says, you know what? You're like, you're like sons of a father. And the first, father is just, the first son is saying, you know what? I, I just want to live as if you don't exist. You know, that's where evolution comes from. It's Darwin's way of trying to explain the universe without there being a God. Darwin said, you know what, I just, I want to act as if, I'm going to live my life as if there is no God. How can I do that? And that's what the the younger son did years early. He just said, I just want to live my life as if there is no God, no dad, no father over me, no rules. Live my life for myself. But then you get the older son. And the older son, notice the words he says, the relationship he has with his dad, he says, Dad, all these day, all these years I've been what? Slaving for you. You see, you have both groups of people in the world. You have the people who want to live as if God doesn't exist, and now you have the religious people who think that God is some big ogre, some big taskmaster, and we have to please him by slaving for him all the time. And that's what they thought God was. That's who they thought God was. Maybe you're here this morning, and that's who you think God is. Maybe you think you've blown it, and you've wandered off, and you want to come home, but, but you think you've got to repay God. Just like the younger son said to his dad, you know what, Dad, make me like one of your hired servants. I'll pay you back. I'll work it off. What skills did the younger son have? Only one that we know of. He's a pig feeder. That's the extent of his abilities. Probably not a whole lot of need for pig feeders in his dad's ranch. But he said, I'll work it off. I'll do it. I'll just work it off. Or better yet, the older son who just says, you know, all these years I've been slaving for you. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you think that, that that's the only way you can please God is to slave for him, work your fingers to the bone. This giant taskmaster master who you have to please with all of this works and all this effort And Jesus just wants to say, you know what? My son was lost and he's found. So we're going to have a party and celebrate. That's what he wants to do with you and I. I didn't see anybody's hand not go up when when, uh, Gretchen asked, have you ever been lost? Everybody's hand should go up because you know what the old song says, I once was lost, but now I'm found. You see, brothers and sisters, this story is is to the Pharisees, but it's about us. It's about how we see our relationship with God. Do we want to live our life like the younger brother and just wander off and just, I just want to live my life as if there is no God. And you're free to do that. You're free to do that. And we'll pray that eventually verse 17 will dawn on you when he came to his senses and come home. Or maybe you're home. Maybe you've been in the church all your life. Maybe you've been a church member all your life. And you think that God is this God that you have to please with all of this effort and all of this work and all of these good deeds. And God just says, you're just my child. I just want to love you. I just want you to love me back. That's all. Parent and child. You don't have to please him. You don't have to work to earn his effort. You don't have to work to earn his love. He gives it freely. Wants to pour it out on us. But see, that's what the Pharisees were all about. They were all about good works and earning God's favor and toeing the line, eating this and not eating that, growing this and not growing this out and cutting this off and wearing this and not wearing that. They were all about the rules, all about making sure that that they did it right. 
so that God would love them. And Jesus is trying to say through this parable that that's not what it's about at all. Come home. You're always welcome back. And when you do, God throws a party because God loves a party. The story is told of Tony Campolo. He was giving a series of uh, talks in Hawaii. I know, suffering for the Lord in Hawaii. <laughs> but when Tony, Camp- and some of you know Tony Campolo, have heard of him and that stuff and heard of his, his talks. But Tony Campolo went one time and, and he never sets his watch off of Eastern time. He always keeps it on Eastern time. So at three in the morning, he's out walking the streets of Hawaii. And he goes to this coffee shop. And he's sitting there having coffee and about 4 a.m., all the prostitutes from Honolulu come in to have breakfast. He didn't think much of it, and he hears them talking back and forth, and no big deal, and they leave, and he leaves. And next night, same thing. Gets in there about 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, all these prostitutes come in, and they start talking. And he hears one of them say to, to another one, he says, you know, tomorrow's my birthday. And one of, the, one of the other prostitutes says, well, big deal, what do you want, a party? And she says, no, I was just telling you that it was my birthday. So Tony sat there longer than normal and waited for him to leave. And when he left, he, he talked to the cafe owner. He says, you know what? We ought to throw a party for her tomorrow night. We ought to just surprise her and throw her a party. And he says, you know what? That's a good idea. Let's do it. I'll bake the cake. And Tony says, I'll get the decorations and I'll get here early and we'll set it up. And sure enough, he gets there and he sets up this cafe. And 4 o'clock, all the prostitutes come in and they have a big party for her. And they give her the birthday cake, and they sing happy birthday, and she looks at it, and they're all saying, cut the cake, cut the cake. And she says, no, I I just want to look at it. No, come on, cut the cake. And she says, no, I've never had a birthday cake before. And so they wait for her to enjoy looking and just having this cake. And and finally, someone turns to Tony and says, well, well, how'd this all happen? And he says, well, we just decided to have a birthday party, and... And uh, they asked the guy who owns a diner, well, well, why did you do this? He said, well, that was his idea. And so the prostitutes went up to Tony and they said, uh, so, you know, what do you do? And he says, well, I'm, I'm a pastor at a church. And they said, really, what kind of church? And he says, well, I'm the pastor of a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at four in the morning. <laughs> and one of the prostitutes said, no, you're not. Because if there was a church like that, I'd go. You see, we wander off. The lost child, as, as, we, as we are lost children, we wander off. But know that you can always come home. It doesn't matter if you've lived your life as if God never existed. Just come on back. It doesn't matter if you've been in the church all your life and think that God is some taskmaster that you have to please. Come on back. The party's waiting. You're invited. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the prodigal son, as we know him. The son who wanted to live on his own, but Lord, the the story is not about the son at all. It's about an, an extravagant father. A father who loves his children so much that he's willing to humiliate himself for them. A father who loves his children so much he's even willing to say, if you want to live without me, you go right ahead. But know that you can always come home. And that's the love you show to us. A love that allows us to live as we like, but a love that also allows us to know that the door is always open and we're always invited home. Lord, if some of your children are here this morning and they've wandered off, Through the working of your spirit, would you let them know today that they are welcome home? And Father, if your children are sitting in the pews and think that you're some dominating taskmaster who has to be pleased at all, at all times, would you help them to throw off that image and let them know that they are welcome to come home too? To a God who loves unconditionally and a God who's waiting to throw a party for their return. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me as we